everybody. Welcome to week 115. Every every time I say that, like I know it's another week, but it's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> we are still doing this. But it's great because we we got all kinds of stuff to talk about with due diligence and the anatomy of the deal. So we're gonna we went into the LOI last week in great detail. Hopefully that was beneficial to people. We're gonna go deeper into due diligence, and we've got due diligence checklist that Jack is gonna find for us at some point, which will be great. Uh, we've got some stories that will be good accentuating points and whatever else you guys want to talk about, whatever you guys have on your mind. And as a, you know, kind of a spoiler alert, I think next week we will probably start moving into this theme on how do we re recession proof our business? You know, it's, it's heating up out there and I hear it a lot. Adam hears it a lot. I'm sure at the Jack does too. Gosh, what are we doing? And so that'll be great. Oh, okay. So I could count on you, Robert Mayetta, to give us, boy, you, you gave us a, you've been writing here for a while before we even launched. So I could see, if you don't mind, a few questions about ERTC, employee retention tax credit outside the revenue test. So assuming company does not meet the revenue test, do any of the following events qualify? So you guys can look at this and we can weigh in on it. If a business voluntarily closed for four weeks due to COVID outbreak of the employees, but did not pay those employees during that period of closure, is the company eligible for ERTC for this event? Second question, if an employee was out sick with COVID for two weeks and the company did not pay the employee for this time off, can the claim be made uh, for ERTC for that event? Third question, can ERTC claim be made if the supply chain issue caused limited inventory that deferred sales re recognition? Four, man, you have been busy. Uh, if a company has is having issues trying to find employees to hire, can ERTC can't claim be filed? We're going to have to send you to ERC today. I can tell you that right now. But um, if a business travel event needed to be canceled due to COVID, can ERC, e, ERC, TC claim be filed? And then the final thing, is it true that 941 can be amended for up to three years to claim ERTC? Whew, I don't know if yeah. we are qualified to answer any of or I'm, all of those we, questions, but ERC yeah, we, we got we, we got that, Gary. Okay, um, cool. Yeah, so because I was looking for something to have an opening tirade on anyway. So thank you, Robert, for that. Well, there you go. Um, yeah. So the first two points, which is, hey, I voluntarily have to close because you know people had people had COVID and I didn't pay people. Um, those are not covered by ERTC because you know the whole point of ERTC was really tor targeted towards people that experienced a shutdown due to a government imposed uh, or experienced a shutdown or rev that, le that led to a revenue loss due to a government imposed um, shutdown, which is 2020, or alternatively in 2021, you know, really just effectively had a, uh, a, re a revenue loss. So, you know, the, the first two are not going to help you unless there was a revenue loss. You just said there's not a revenue loss. So, kind of get into, you know, what would qualify in here. Um, what would qualify in here is the supply chain issue, but the supply chain issue is super, super specific in that it can't be real. You know, I just came back from um, Los Angeles uh, and which is why I have this amazing tan that Gary was commenting on. Uh, yes, you just, do. Just, just, kidding, just kidding with that. It's actually the lighting. Um, but <laughs> The, uh, you know, so you can still see container ships, you know, off, off the port of, off the port in Long Beach. So one can make the case that, well, that's supply chain issue, but, but not really, you know, in the intent of the employee retention tax credit, the supply chain issue that qualifies 
and there are people out here that will say, well, anybody and their brother can qualify. I'm just saying, buyer, beware on that. So our interpretation of supply chain issue is that your supplier needs to have been shut down by a government order or alternatively um, had to change what they manufactured due to the Defense Production Act, you know, m- meaning like they switched gears, <laughs> you know, like they, they went from, you know, manufacturing widgets to manufacturing uh, masks, you know, and you, you needed widgets from that. So that's what's going to qualify or alternatively, you know, you were, you know, you, you bought stuff from a manufacturer in California and they were shelter in place for everything, no exceptions, your supply chain was shut down, period. That that's your qualification on the supply chain issue, not just hey, you're having you're having trouble finding stuff. Um so with the company having issues trying to find employees to hire, you know, that unfortunately that doesn't count. Um, you know, some of these could qualify for the um, FFCRA credit, which is the basically the 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 COVID version of the Family Medical and Leave Act. Um, business event travel. So where that would come into place, even if you didn't meet the broader revenue recognition test, is you know using BGW as an example. This is not, you know, this is not actually how we generate revenue, but it's a, but if we did generate revenue this way. So let's say that BGW derives revenue from its CPA firm primarily by referral um, source. However, for one specialty service line, our transaction advisory practice, germane to this conversation, meaning, hey, we advise people on how to do transactions. 90% of our business came from three trade show events in the business, meaning like, you know, we go to the trade show, 90% of our business um, comes from contacts that we established and sales orders we generated those trade shows and trade shows were shut down. Couldn't go to them. They're canceled due to COVID. Um, In my transaction advisory practice, even though BGW was actually up in revenue, my transaction advisory practice was actually down, you know, 80% of revenue. I could qualify for ERTC then based on that service line specifically being disrupted based on the way that it generates um, revenue. So I'd still have to, I'd still have to pass a revenue reduction test that, you know, meaning like, you know, it, I think it was greater than 10%, you know, reduction, you know, in activities or revenue or whatever my measurement thing is going to be, but, it has to be because that service line specifically was directly affected due to a government shutdown order. Um, and then the last question, yeah, that's true. And it's actually a little bit longer than that based on the criteria because they ca- kind of gave a blanket, you know, starting point, I believe, of the second quarter of 2020 is the same starting point date that's off the top of my head. So you get, you get for those early periods in 2020, I think you get an extra three months maybe um, to file, but yeah, they could be amended up three years. So there's no, you know, other than what, other than needing the cash flow, you know, there's no huge rush on this. So our counsel to people that haven't necessarily needed the cash flow is to, you know, make sure that you get it right. Um, but the downside of that is, you know, you if you go ahead and do file a claim, you're also going to have to amend the tax returns related to the year in which the credit was earned, whether it's 2020 or 2021. So just you know, keep that in mind that you're going to also have to amend all tax returns um, as well to reflect the receipt of the credit. So I think that's it. There we go, Good Gary. Good job, Adam. You didn't lose all all your brain cells on the beach of California. That's a really good thing, man. I think you could come back with a great tan, all energized. No, I love it. Absolutely. And if you wouldn't mind on the, on the, on the diligence conversation, I would like, you know, a couple minutes at the beginning before we kick it off the Jack, um, just to get to some common stuff that we get asked all the time that I think is going to be germane to what Jack covers. Okay, cool. Jack, did you have any current event things 
that Cliff Clayman typically likes to rant about. <laughs> so I'm very disappointed. I was while Adam was talking, I found or something was sent to me and it had Cliff Clavin with his mailbox or his mail mail person mailman uniform on and I can't find it. So um, no, I'll wow. have to, I'll have to double up next week or maybe throw in a dad joke next time. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Uh, that sounds good. Well, Adam, do you want to go ahead and then dive into the due diligence stuff? Or do you want me to tell the story on the front end? <laughs> uh, go with your story on the front end. Max, so hot. All right, cool. So to protect the innocent, I've, I've had a couple conversations with CEO, former CEO of an $80 million company here in town that when he saw, and he's on this uh, uh, attendee list, I think, today, but when he saw that we were talking about due diligence today, he's like, man, have I got a story for you. And it's, you know, I'll probably get some of this stuff wrong, but here's the Cliff's notes. $30 million company does a merger with a larger competitor. Hey, this is going to be great. Combined entity ends up getting to 80 million. They had, and he's like, lessons learned. This company, the smaller one, they had run their books really clean. They had audited financials for 10 years. Isn't it interesting that a lot of times we project our protocols and assumptions and our thought processes on other people and assume that they do the same thing? Well, that was not the case in this other merger that was with a, a company bigger than they were. And he said, man, lessons learned. He goes, first of all, they, their books were a mess. We should have demanded audited financials. We should have tripled our due diligence budget from 75,000 bucks on some of that to, it should have been triple that. So to 220 or whatever. And ultimately, because of the, the rocks buried beneath the surface and the fact that it took them a year to clean up the books from this other entity and then expose the rocks, and yeah, they had some recourse, but the damage was done. They had, so ownership or you know, control positions had to be renegotiated because of these revelations. But the damage was done. And so when they hit COVID years later, um, the banks started basically called notes and forced their hand out, you know, and forced a sale that they didn't want to have to do. So, and we all probably have stories. Uh, I, 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 I joined a firm and I thought I had done a lot of due diligence and I had done a lot for a 32 year old guy. <laughs> but not enough and boy did i pay dearly for it you know so point ma made due diligence don't skim over it because you can pay me now or you can pay me later remember those penzo commercials well uh, it can it, it can cost you a lot so that's my story yeah um so with kicking in the topic, you know, uh, I swear that what I'm about to say is actually complimentary what, to what Gary said, not contradictory. So keep that in mind before I say it, <laughs> because it's really driven by what stage are you at? And, and is it follow up to the, the Letterman Tent conversation that we had last week? And, that, and that's really you know, a common question that I get asked a lot, you know, whether it's buy side or sell side, meaning our client's about to sell or our client is about to buy somebody is, you know, man, what should I ask for? <laughs> or I'm getting asked for all this stuff. You know, what should I do with, you know, how should I respond? And my answer to that is always around, it, it is always the same, you know, primarily, which is, you know, look, it depends on where you're at. If you were at the point where you don't have an LOI yet, my response is not a lot of information. 
<laughs> you know, there's no, there's no point to it. Otherwise, you will get paralysis by analysis if you're the buyer or the sell or well actually that applies in both cases like if you're the seller you're you're going to just want to kill the buyer before you even know whether or not you're in the ballpark on the price and the buyer and if you're the buyer you're gonna have analysis paralysis and basically have the opposite effect in the seller being like oh my god you know we're not even the ballpark you know on price and that's what rigmarole you put me through so you know my advice is always you know, kind of pre-LOI, your diligence list, you know, really keep it simple. You know, basically all you're looking for are items that would lead you to conclude that you need to have a price adjustment up or down from market. And, you know, generically, what, you know, what do you need to do that? You know, you need a tax return, you need financial statements, and you need some indication of customer churn and customer concentration. That's it, you know, because the tax return is going to help you validate, you know, look, I mean, generally people don't over inflate their tax returns. <laughs> so, so that that's like your truth. <laughs> you know, it's like, you, you know, if they're bad, but someone represented it to you that things were really good, then, you know, it's like, it's like, Ricky, Lucy, you got some explaining to do. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that's going to be your truth point. You know, your historic financial statements are going to start to help it to tell the story that kind of explains the difference between the tax terms and, 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 and what you're hearing is the story. And then the customer concentration is going to tell you a lot more around, you know, hey, you know, am I, is Walmart the only customer that's in here? <laughs> you know, because you're already going to know a lot about gross profit from the financial statements, the tax trends, but you're looking for, am I going to have a revenue, am I going to have a customer concentration problem, which would cause me to potentially do a purchase price, you know, adjustment downwards because that represents a significant area of risk. To me, to me, that's really all you need with the proper legal advice up front in drafting the, the LOI, because you can pretty quickly get to, if you're in the ballpark on price or terms with those items, you know, with kind of the, the caveats that, hey, this is still subject to me doing a formal due diligence and be able to back out if I find something I don't like. You know, this is just to make sure that we're playing the same sport and, in fact, have agreed to play the same sport in the same city following the same rules, <laughs> you know, but if I can't even get to that point, there's no sense providing me asking you for a list of 5,000 items or you asking me for a list of, of 5,000 items. And that, that really kind of applies to um, if you're working with a private equity firm as well, that, or, or an investment banker that's representing you, because, you know, uh, on the one hand, I can understand where the investment banker is coming from coming from, hey, I need everything because I don't want any skeletons that I don't know about coming out. That is, that is a common, that is, a, it's common to have skeletons come out in, in, the, in the sales process. At the same time, you know, that shouldn't slow down getting expressions of interest, which is really kind of the precursor to getting LOIs. And you just don't need a lot of information to put together a deal tombstone. You, you just don't, you know. Um, so that's, that's my two cents on brevity. You know, again, it's, it's brevity pre-transaction or pre-LOI and then exhaustive in the things that matter post-LOI or post-LOI, you know, but, but when you're, when you're kind of trying to finalize, um, are we really going to do a deal or not. And from that perspective, you know, really, you're just, you know, you kind of look into, you know, some of the stuff that, that Jack's, that, that Jack's going to go over. And, you know, we've covered in prior, in prior calls, meaning like, hey, if I buy this thing, you know, is there going to be revenue flight? You know, my customer contract's pretty good. You know, do I have the employees kind of locked in so they can't just close shop tomorrow and go, you know, compete with me? Um, do, are, do I have any, if I have any intellectual property, is it properly protected? I mean, versus like, 
I don't know. I mean, it's probably relevant to know the salary history and pay history of every single employee going back to 1995, but is it really, you know, like if you can't provide that, is that the end of the world? No, I, if I'm trading, I'd rather know more about the customers that I'm acquiring um, than, you know, the background of Sally at the front desk and her salary history going back to 1995. So with that in mind, I will shut up and um, remember everything I just said there is not a contradiction. It's actually complimentary no, because I, 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 still I, want, I want it to be pretty exhaustive. Yeah. And I think that was the issue with them. It was post LOI, but the pre LOI, I like that. Just keep it brief and to the point. Um, Bruce brings up a really good point in the chat. He says, your comments are addressing this indirectly, but having the right people performing the due diligence is essential. Skills are important, technical and people oriented, but you have to recognize if, if you have talented but, uh, individuals who go into it with 100% in favor or 100% against the deal, it's not going to give you the truth point you want that is a good point so very good point what's the bias all right so we want to go into a little more details on so the uh Come on, story the storyline goes that uh so now you've signed an loi you've done it correctly you've gone through your pre uh signing due diligence to come up with a a uh, reasonable purchase price, obviously based on certain assumptions that need to be validated and kicked around uh, post LOI, but during the due diligence phase, um, you have you know some of the financial materials, obviously, in order to make those decisions. And so you uh, now, and, and you have had an LOI that has been vetted by appropriate professionals so that you don't leave things on the table or you don't give things away depending on which side that you're on. So now you get into, um, let's look at the stuff. And uh, this is usually driven by the buyer and buyer's counsel and buyer's professionals as to what they wanna see. Um, sometimes preemptively when we represent a seller and we're going through the process and we've talked many times before about what that looks like as far as making your business more sellable, more sexy, uh, trim away the fat, all the little euphemisms that we've said over the past 100 weeks or so in and out. And so you, you uh, potentially have done that. And so we'll put, uh, suggest that they start putting stuff into a, a data room in anticipation of moving forward. Sometimes if you're dealing with, uh, many times if you're dealing with an investment banker in some, or some other professional um, a business broker that is helping you through a process of sale, you, you will have gone through that in preparation of the pitch, the solicitation to prospect buyers moving forward. So um, I want to show you and go through with you what a, our, our due diligence list looks like, or at least a variation of it. I noticed that it has an updated date of 2020, but this that's because this is the redacted form without uh, people's names in it. So I'm going to share that screen Okay. Can you guys see that? All good? Yeah. All right. Okay. So, um, you know, and, and what will happen is, is that we'll launch this as buyer's counsel to uh, seller and seller's counsel. And this is the, um, not the, the super hefty one, but it's pretty hefty. And this is the one that we use for, uh, equity transactions, because an asset transaction, you're not going to ask for some of these things. You'll distill this down. So there's a different version, but I wanted to show you kind of the things you ask for if you were into an equity transaction, because you're going to want to have and ask and receive more information because you're becoming, you're, you're inheriting a business rather than just pulling away its assets and, and taking on certain liabilities. So stating the obvious, uh, well, let me, and I'm going to share, if I can find it, there was, um, okay, this, and hopefully I've moved it to a point where it remains mostly anonymous, but this is what 
where the stuff goes to when we're in control of the virtual data room. So this is essentially a, a data room that from um, last year, middle of last year on a transaction. And you'll see that the folders essentially match the sections in the due diligence checklist that we're going to talk about in a moment. And so what will happen is, and if you look at the people on the folder, that it will have um, obviously my team, it'll have our uh, professionals, clients, CPAs, et cetera, but it'll also have the other side on there as well, obviously, because they, if we're representing the buyer, the seller is the one that is populating this. Now there is a variation of this and um, I call it document purgatory, which is a side that is the private side that looks just like this, but it is where our client, the seller, if our, if our client is a seller, is putting the materials in there for further evaluation and then essentially blessing by everyone, whether it's the CFO, the CEO, CPAs, attorneys, that then goes into the shared side, which looks just like this, they look identical, but we, one person is in control of a document going from the left side, the left side to the right side. And that's the way we maintain document and version control as to what is showing to them. Because it could be, for example, we're working on maybe um, a, uh, some sort of calculation on a spreadsheet. And so uh, it's, it's, we're using the private side as a collaboration tool in order to see where things are uh, and to run numbers, et cetera. And once the final version is complete, then that is what goes into the shared side of things. So this is essentially you'll see, and then, well, the last one is, is um, personalized. So we go back to due diligence checklist. So, you know, all the introductory stuff and, you know, and two components that you want to keep track of, obviously what it is, and you want to keep track of document numbers and version numbers and when it was sent. There are variations of this. I, we have a program called Latera Trans, I think it's called Transact, that is a much more robust version of this, which it kind of combines the checklist and the document production together. And you can see, and you can mark things complete and it'll create a checklist of open items that are left, completed items, et cetera. So um, this is, there, there is additional technology that you can implement in the process, but we think that that, that just gets kind of clunky unless you're in a really large, large transaction where there's a lot of moving parts and documents and collaboration and that kind of stuff. So what you're going to do is you're going to um, uh, populate this stuff and you're going to provide things. So you start out with the obvious, which is the governing documents. You know, what, tell me all about the, the entity that is being sold. So you put all the governing documents, minutes of meetings, et cetera. In an asset transaction, you're going to want stuff like in item A, which is all of the information regarding ownership, but you may not necessarily need all of the, the back stuff in the minute book, which is this is what happened during this period of time. And these are the minutes from the past 20 years or so. So um, ownerships of shares or other units of ownership. So you're going to have things like, um, uh, and you're going to want to know this information in either type of transaction, because you're going to want to know that when you get that certificate that is signed by um, the, uh, the shareholders or the members of an entity, and they are authorizing a person to sign on those uh, documents at closing, you're going to want to know that you have proper authority. So I usually ask for the operating agreement. I ask for the shareholders agreement for the bylaws, et cetera, and making sure that the person that they're telling me can sign those documents are in fact the people that are going to sign. You'll find many times, and our clients are guilty of this as well on the seller side, which is, oh yeah, we kind of haven't done that for the past seven years or so, or 10 years or so. So um, now we have to do catch up minutes and then, oh yeah, the person who needed to sign that five years ago is no longer a director or we bought that person out. They're no longer a member, you know, those kind of things. And so um, those uh, can become a little bit difficult, but you're going to want to know that you actually bought the company and the person who sold it to you has the requisite authority to do that. So um, again, going through all these various things, uh, a lot of this is related to um, ownership, but then you want to know who's running the business. So who, what's the, the management organization, the, the, the flow chart of responsibilities and who's doing what? Um, 
other names that you know business names trade names listed jurisdictions so sometimes what we'll find is is that you have a business that has a beachhead in a state, but they have not properly registered as a foreign corporation or foreign LLC doing business in that state. They've been probably, hopefully, paying the appropriate taxes to that state for the business that's in that state, but they have not asked for permission to be operating in that state. That's a whole different conversation as to whether or not you have to go through additional hoops on the legal side to be doing business in a particular state. If you're just selling stuff into a state, generally speaking, not. If you have sales reps in that state, possibly yes. If you have an office in that state, usually definitely yes. So again, it just depends on what's going on. Um, and then substantial contacts. And this, this, you'll see similar questions, but we're trying to get at, it's kind of like when you take one of those qu online quizzes um, and they ask you the same question but they reverse it from a different direction to make sure you're being consistent with your answers and that you can cross validate. So that's, um, that's essentially one of the reasons why we ask so many questions and it seems like it's the same stuff. Uh, and then you go into financial matters. So you're going to want to know everything about the business related to uh, their contracts. Um, and, and there's actually a specific material contract section, but uh, this financial matters, you're talking about loans and other things in relation to the business, um, specifically guarantees, bonds, letters of credit, uh, those kind of things. Um, budgets, pro formas, anything that's been prepared that shows the projections that, uh, that the business thinks it's going to do moving forward that you are basically going to take over so you can kind of see where things are going. If they've done an analysis, let's say, for example, on supply chain issues, You'd want to see that because it may be that you are not fully appreciative of the fact that a part that is integral to the machines that are being produced by this manufacturing company that you're buying, maybe that one part is a problem, um, a la the pieces that are missing in a lot of automobiles that I imagine is probably about this big. That um, And you go to places like port cities like Cal in California down in Charleston, um, you drive down by the water and you're gonna see a lot of parked cars, uh, line by line, you know, lines of them that are brand new, just sitting there because they can't do anything with them. Still, financial statements and reporting, accounts receivable, accounts payable, so all the things you would think of, and then you get into inventory and those kind of things as well. Um, and then the, the kind of catch-all, which is this includes each affiliated company. So you don't just get to give the information on the parent company, but if there is a relationship with an affiliated company, um, either directly or indirectly, that needs to be reported as well. This is where we talk about material agreements. And um, just so it's very clear, we go through the various types of agreements that we deem as being material. You usually get into a discussion in the transaction, usually in the due diligence or the, the requirements uh, in the schedules of a purchase agreement with specificity as to um, what is what is material, what is a material contract. And it, is, it can be dependent on various factors. It can be dependent upon longevity, uh, meaning that if you are locked into a contract for a longer period of time than 30, 60, 90 days, that could be considered material. And it really depends on the industry and the business. It could be the dollar amount that is related to the, the particular contract. So what, what is material um, for one business may not be material for another because it may be that ordinary course contracts are already in the $50,000 range. And so um, you know, those still need to be listed, but they may not be considered necessarily material contracts if it's something that is just ordinary course. Um, supply requirements contracts or your relationships. It's not just relationships with your customers, it's relationships with your suppliers and other incoming items. And then you get into insurance policies and all the other things that we, and so again, we're trying to pull apart what we believe are material contracts. And then you get into real property. Um, and this is uh, owned, leased, or otherwise used in the business. So sometimes people think, well, we don't own any property, so that's not a big deal. Well, if you're going to lease a piece of property, you're going to assume a lease that actually can be pretty big. And many times that ends up being a bottleneck is that you have a landlord that is not going to be cooperative or is maybe gave 
the, uh, the current tenant, the seller, a great rate, or maybe it's a legacy rate from 15 years ago, rates have gone up, this is an opportunity to renegotiate. So they're gonna be difficult. Um, they may not, um, you wanna know if there are guarantees in place. Uh, if you're lucky, maybe a personal guarantee is burned off with respect to the seller and you don't have to worry about that. Usually they're gonna ask the buyer owners to, to pony up their uh, personal signature on guarantees. So you wanna be prepared for what that is and the possibility of having to negotiate maybe a limited uh, guarantee for the buyer. And you go into rights of first refusal and all those other things uh, in relation to that. Talk about personal property. Obviously those will become schedules in the asset purchase agreement or even in the, the stock purchase agreement because you're gonna wanna know what those assets are. Um, intellectual property, uh, IP related that you own or are otherwise licensed to use. And um, it, it, all materiality is also in the eye of the beholder. So if you have um, specialized software, even though the core of it may be off the shelf, but you have a license for add-ons and those kind of things, those are gonna be important because you know, what you want is you want information, all the information that is required or necessary or important in order for you as the buyer to operate the business after the, the, the closing and move forward on day one and not have to figure this stuff out and not have to renegotiate. You want it to be a smooth transition, regardless of whether it's an asset deal or a stock deal. Environmental, um, focusing on ownership, but when you lease a, a property and there are environmental issues, and it's not necessarily environmental issues of the particular piece of property that you're going to lease. It could be that, um, and this happened with a client a couple of years ago, restaurant next door, and there was a, a common pathway for um, waste. And I'm talking about like grease and, and water waste, not necessarily bathroom waste, but, um, and they didn't connect it properly. so the grease trap uh, created a problem for the water flow in the sinks of my clients, the sinks and drains and other stuff. Um, and they were heavy water users. It was, um, it's uh, um, uh, a pet store franchisee, multi-unit franchisee. And in this particular property, there was an issue. So you're going to know if there are environmental issues. And, and we looked at uh, and because there was already this problem at the property, we went back and we looked at some environmental reports and seeing what was going on because there had been some assessments done because they thought there was an environmental issue. It was, they didn't know what, where it was coming from. So, and they thought it had leaked into the ground. They didn't know. So they did all that stuff. And, and you want to have access to that and be knowledgeable about that. Um, engineering, legal tax, other reports prepared within the last five years. So again, just information about the business, information about the property. Um, especially if it was a property that was constructed by the seller or on behalf of the seller, you're going to want to know, um, you know, where, how it was constructed. You want to know the plans. Let's say you want to add on uh, to the building or whatever it may be. Um, and also if you're buying it, you're going to want to know as an owner, uh, you may end up selling it down the road. So you're going to want to be, your buyer is going to want those, that information as well. Employee matters, definitely, that you're going to want to know, are there any issues? Well, you're going to want to know the history. You're going to want to know if there's any issues. You're going to want to know if there's any plans in place, if there's any promises in place for stock ownership or for, for equity ownership, bonus plans, um, those kind of things. So uh, even if you're not going to inherit those employees, even if you're not going to employ those employees, you still may get hung up or roped into a successor liability claim that you have the assets to satisfy this liability. And, um, you know, so you just need to be careful about those kind of things. Tax matters. So specifically getting into that litigation, licenses, permits, and other governmental issues. So even if it's a non-transferable license, so for example, a, um, a ALE license, so beer uh, and liquor, licenses and permits. So you still want to know and you want to make sure that they are operating the business properly. You want to know if they've had any issues. So are they already on the ALE's radar? And, you know, regardless of that, there's been an ownership transition and you, you know, that, that you may be on their 
uh, hit list for uh, reinspections. You kind of want to know that and um, you know, make sure that you don't slip up uh, early on when you take on the business. Um, correspondence, so you kind of want uh, information. Um, this bucket usually is not filled very much, um, but we try to focus it on complaints and um, demands and those kind of things. So really not just anything, any communications, but the ones that um, are alleging problems or other things in relation to that. So, um, and then miscellaneous, this is the true kind of like uh, catch all bucket of things. So you'll see, as I, as I showed before that you, this is kind of um, the way it flows. It's not exactly, cause I think we had some personalization uh, like privacy and data security, um, which is actually, and I think about it in our due diligence list is an additional section. So now with things like data breaches, et cetera, uh, credit card breaches, those kind of things, I usually include that in uh, my representations and warranties that the seller is saying, we have not had those things. And if we've had those things, what has been the remediation? Um, I will tell you on the, the buyer side, I push back on, I mean, I'm sorry, on the seller side in making that representation, I push back on that and say things like to our knowledge or, hey, look, we believe it's compliant, but we are not the credit card processor. We take a piece of plastic and we swipe it and then it magically goes there and then magically money shows up in our account. So we're not going to represent anything that there has not been a security breach somewhere else. And if our stuff is breached, like if someone... I mean, it's harder these days, but, you know, with skimmers that uh, if that happened and we don't know about it, you know, it's, we can't, we can't represent that there has not been a breach. So there's usually a knowledge qualifier for those kind of things. Um, so that's a very quick run through on due diligence process and the questions that are asked and how you um, basically receive it and process it and move forward. And then the next step, which I don't want to get too far ahead, but you know, we'll talk about kind of uh, the the aspects of asset purchase agreements and stock purchase agreements. That um, this information then morphs into the schedules that are uh, part of the purchase agreement, and it could be that uh, it is uh, a, a list of, let's say, under tax matters, there was an audit that occurred two years ago. In the agreement, you'll say, except as provided in Schedule 3.21, there have been no, there's been no activity with the IRS, the NCDOR, any state, um, any state financial institution or regulatory agency or any local agency. And then you would list that, and then it would say IRS audit 2019. Um, all clear or no issues raised and you know clean bill of health but in a legal way to say those kind of things so that everybody's on notice that that happened and that everything was good so um that is kind of the next step of what you do with this information other than processing it and dealing with the issues so let's say there's an issue with a phase you get a phase one and you look at it and it's like well wait a minute there was something identified here now i love my environmental law partners and I am appreciative of all the work that environmental companies do with respect to their phase one and phase two. But you think that um, lawyers do a lot of CYAs in their stuff. Um, they will report on everything that ever occurred that could possibly be a contamination um, from the beginning of time till now in relation to the property. So, you know, be aware of that. And, you know, early on in my career, looking at phase ones, I'm like, oh my God, um, we can't buy this property. And it's like, okay, no, this is what it says all the time that there was an, uh, a, a fire that um, uh, a car exploded and leaked oil. Uh, and, you know, there's an oil spot still on the concrete. Uh, kind of thing. And because they noticed it, they observed it, they looked into it, and then they have to report on it. So um, it's kind of a bizarre example. It's a true example, but it's a bizarre example. So um, that's uh, the due diligence process and documentation in a very small nutshell. Well, as Adam said, brevity on the front end before the LOI 
make sure that your butt's covered with appropriate legal counsel and your CPA on the LOI, but especially with legal counsel before you sign any anything. And then you could go into all the depth of the due diligence. It's interesting going back to my friend's example early on. I think they, and they had good people around them. The, the one thing that that they didn't have or didn't insist upon were audited financials. And I think they had, clearly they had financials, but they didn't insist upon audited financials. And probably because that firm's books were a mess, which is interesting. We've seen plenty of companies come to us that had train wrecks and rat nests, rat's nests of books. And sometimes it takes a long time to clean those things up. And in this case, it took them a year to clean them up. So if it delays a deal by a year, you have to make the choice, you know, is it worth rushing through? Oh gosh, we got to get this deal done because, you know, time will pass us or, you know, in this, this guy's case, it was a nightmare for years cost them dearly so yeah i think yeah. that the two the two cents that i would add to, to jack's list is that you know it if you you know even if you're not selling your company that's a good list to have available um and it in in kind of thinking through that in terms of like okay well i'm not going to sell my company tomorrow but if i spend a year kind of plucking away in terms of getting this stuff together, you know, that's, that's not, you know, that's not a bad idea. Um, in, in the sense that, you know, something bad happens, you know, get, in other words, the effort spent on it, I think will more than outweigh the cost, um, in terms in, in meaning the, the benefit of spending the effort on it will more than outweigh the cost in the sense that you know, you're just going to uncover some stuff about yourself that, you know, you felt like, hey, these are just holes that I needed to get plugged um, that are going to help me get my crap together. On the other side of that um, equation, you know, if you're if you're the buyer and you publish this request list, the more that you him and ha and make a big deal out of the ability to provide this information and the hassle factor associated with getting it together, it's like, I got to tell you, you know, it causes the spotty sense to go up. Because it just kind of tells me there's something here. This place isn't as well managed as it was as it was purported to be. Um, maybe they're hiding something, or may, maybe it is innocent, but it's sloppy nonetheless. You know, do I really want to be working with sloppy people? In other words, you know, if someone produces this list, should you be able to salute and say, "Sir, yes, sir," to be up there tomorrow? You know, that that'd be great, but that's probably not realistic. But if it takes you months, you know, to pull it together, even if it takes you weeks to pull it together um, without substantial compliance, it's going to raise questions um, from the from the buyer's perspective and just cause them to dig deeper, you know, sort of like, uh, yeah. In other words, you know, it's probably it's probably like, you know, since Jack would say Adam likes to play a lawyer on TV, I'm going to play one now. It's like, I don't know. I mean, if I, if I request discovery, you know, am I kind of better off dumping a mountain of stuff on poor Jack to go through or trickling it into where he's got plenty of time to go through everything and ask more questions. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, I, I I probably would say, you know, Hey, there's only going to be a 30 day time limit set on diligence and I'm going to have you everything on day five by day five. So I've capped your time. And I've given you everything that you need versus we have to extend the time because I couldn't get you the stuff that you're looking for. And that's just going to cause you to ask more questions than you really probably, because I mean, you know, the advisors got, the advisors got to get paid. <laughs> you know, so like, I don't, I've never met anybody that said, Oh, I'm purposely digging because you know, that'll raise my fee for digging more. Like, I know that's a common myth and out there. I've never met anybody in the business that um, 
had like truly that's been their mode of operation. However, you know, if you're getting paid two hundred thousand dollars to do the job, you know, you want to do it thoroughly. But if you're time constrained, you're going to do it as thoroughly as your time as the time constraint allows. However, if you don't have any time constraint at all, you're going to go digging as far as the onion will allow you to get get pulled back. So. Mm-hmm. And, and there are variations to that. And one of those variations is what I call the grumpy old man syndrome. And, you know, I have, <laughs> with all due respect, and I don't know if that's a good thing to say or not, because um, <laughs> apparently that whatever you say after that is you're, you know, immune, uh, immune from prosecution. So um, what happens is, and this happened last year in a transaction, and this was uh, the purchase, our client was purchasing an automobile dealership. And uh, it was an older gentleman on the other side. And I sent that due diligence list after we had signed the LOI. And um, it just, it, looking at the, the share file and nothing was really getting put into there. There were a few things that were trickling in via email. And then so I call up opposing counsel and I'm like, um, hey, you know, is there a problem with putting this stuff in there? And he's like, well, you know, you ask us what you a Southern gentleman as well. And I'm not going to do the accent, but it was, um, you ask us whatever you want and we'll provide that. But that list is just way too long. And I said, well, is there something that is, and this was, um, actually it was, it was the asset purchase, but it had the environmental issues, obviously, because they have service base. So they're dealing with environmental hazard materials, oil and stuff. And so we did ask for those questions and, you know, do you have a phase one? And eventually we got it. And then like, do you have phase two? Eventually we got that. You would think that, and here's the phase one. And by the way, here's the phase two, um, none of that. And then, so it came to a point where I told a client, I said, you know, we're, there's no way that you need to make a decision. We're at the period of time that you are going to forfeit the security deposit for the due diligence period, unless you basically say the deal's off. Well, I don't want the deal. No, we can't, we've invested too much time, et cetera. And I said, well, it's not that you're going to do that. It's the threat of doing that. And it's a way to get an extension if there is opposition to doing that. And so it was extended officially, the LOI due diligence period. Um, but in that conversation together, and because there was different messages being, I said, I'm going to get everybody on the phone together, which I very rarely do. And so he, he, I, he says, and I was on a, you usually don't do that unless you know what the outcome is going to be. Um, and that's why you don't do this kind of thing. So he looks, he says, uh, and it's a phone conversation. He's like, um, to my client, well, did you understand everything that your client is asking for in that eight page, 10 page document? And of course the client says, well, no, I really didn't look at it. Uh, that's what you lawyers are supposed to be doing. And he's like, well, I didn't either. So that's why you don't got your stuff. I'm like, okay. Oh, so that gosh. must be the standard. If you just, if you, once you, it's more than two pages, that that's the standard that you're done with due diligence, or you have to ask for everything individually. Um, we eventually got through it, which was fine. And again, as I said, lovely older gentleman, but he just had a certain way of doing things. In fact, we were doing, he was, when I saw him and, and we were at the closing, there were some issues of used car inventory and adjustments and holdbacks and stuff like that. And, you know, I pull out my computer to put it on a spreadsheet. He's like, we don't need that. Takes out a pencil. And starts writing stuff down and starts doing the math. And I'm like, okay, this is how that day is going to go. So instead of spending a few hours, I spent the day up there, Gosh. up in the mountains, um, hanging out while we're doing math on a piece of paper with a pencil, which was mostly <laughs> accurate. There were some mistakes. That's why, okay, calculator, you know, um, kind of thing. He did have an iPhone. It wasn't a flip phone. So I thought, okay, at least a little bit of progress. Oh, wow. So anyway, um, my point in telling all that is that, is that there are exceptions, and I, but I agree with Adam that you know, if, if you're more organized on the front end, then it makes things easier and it, it um, gives people comfort that, okay, you got it together and there's maybe probably not something hiding because you're being transparent, at least the optics of it is transparency. So you have those things going on and, and the opposite is true, which is, is that you know, so my antenna kept getting higher and higher every time this guy said, no, sorry, you know, I don't, I don't think we have a need for that. And I'm like, okay. So then I have to go tell my client, you're not, he's not giving this client has to go to the seller. Seller has to tell his attorney, provide this stuff. 
And so, um, and that's when I had everybody on the phone conversation and, you know, I had to basically say, well, you know, that isn't the standard that you, because you don't want to read 10 pages that you don't get to provide the stuff. We need this stuff. And if there's any questions, then I'm happy to answer those, but I need, well, you know, we don't, um, we're having difficulty uploading it. I'm like, okay, fine. Email it to me. And then I'll have someone on my staff, put it into the data room, which again, is not very difficult to do, but uh, anyway, so enough of that. Just a, a little war story to kind of end us off. Well, you know, both of you bring up really important points. Even if somebody's listening to this and they're not ready to sell or they don't have a deal that's pending or looming, the more organized and together you can be, the higher your price will be for whenever it is time to do a transaction, the better you're probably going to sleep at night and the less cost it's going to be on the back end because it time is money. And if Jack is having to sit by your side while you're doing, you know, getting the abacus out, you know, that's, that's going to take a little more time and it's going to cost more money. So anyway, we, we've been preaching on that for a long time, but it really does make a difference. The more your house is in order, the better. And, and a small variant of that is if you're going through a refinance or recap um, with a bank, you're going to be providing a lot of that information. So you may as well. And we've done that before, which is, hey, can you give us um, the, the, um, the uh, virtual data room on uh, a USB drive just to have? Or can you leave that in there? And we're like, yeah, we're going to deactivate the input output but it'll be static and it'll be there for when you need it the next time. So, yeah. Yeah. Good point. Well, that's a good place to end. Thank you, Robert, for your detailed questions on the front end. Anybody else got questions? Let us know. Um, we still haven't exhausted everything that there is to deal with on the anatomy of a deal, but um, I think we may elect to take a break next week to just go into more detail on this whole recession proofing your business. I think that would be, you know, there's, there's just so much going on right now. And with the Fed just doing a three quarter point hike, I was just talking with a manufacturer this morning about their concerns, supply chain issues, still an issue. They're trying to onshore subassembly because they're you know, stuff that's coming across on boats and container yeah. ships. He gave an example that was interesting. Pre-COVID, or yeah, pre-COVID, a container ship was 3,500 bucks. You know, it's now 12,000. And they're, they're saying, ain't going down for, for the line of what he's bringing in from, from yeah. uh, and, the and Middle the East. The whole, like, just to, just to you know, keep it keep it barney style um you know and i'm not taking credit for this i mean this actually came from i want to say it might have been mark bittner um on a talk that i heard from him re recently you know we're all familiar with mark bittner he's chief economist for wells fargo i think he lives in san francisco now but he used to be a charlotte charlatan but he said look we raise interest rates so that gary holds on to his money and, do, and doesn't spend it. <laughs> and that brings inflation down because Gary is not spending his money. Therefore, if Adam wants to sell something to Gary, I have to make the price attractive, i.e. lower, <laughs> that Gary decides it's worth it to spend my money relative to the interest rate associated with spending that money. So that, that, that's what this whole thing is. And I mean, you know, kind of then you scratch that. Well, wait, if Gary stops buying shit and we're a consumer driven society, doesn't that mean we'll go into recession? It's like, yeah, that is the, that's the balancing act, <laughs> you know, that is trying to navigate like how much is too much and how much is not, not enough. And, you know, there's no, there's no right answer on that because, you know, it, it, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know if they've ever, well, you never hear about the ones that they prevented because they didn't actually happen. <laughs> so, you know, who knows what will happen in this case, but that, that's effectively what happens. 
the interest rate raises so that Gary's butt will pucker and he will not spend money on my goods. So I have to lower the price <laughs> so that Gary's um, butt will unpucker and he'll buy something. Hence, inflation goes down relative to the interest rate being at the rate that it's at. That's the Barney style version of what's happening. So the, <laughs> the technical term is uh, financial sphincter. <laughs> yeah, shenanigans. Because again, you know, if Gary stops buying stuff, and that means, you know, gross dom domestic product, which is kind of the sum total of all goods and services purchased in the U.S., goes down. And if that has two quarters in decline, I think that's when they call, you know, recession, you know, throw the re recession flag. But it's like they're literally talking about they're trying to slow that growth down to like a half percentage point growth. You know, it's like, you don't, that's not a lot of room for error. You know, when, when we've been running, you know, two, three, two, three, four percent kind of digging our way out of um, the COVID uh, hangover. Plus, I mean, again, you know, people got all this free government money. What'd they do with it? Well, you know, spend it. kind of saved it a little bit, but then spin it, you know. Wait, so I'm a yeah. bit confused. Are you saying this all is not Russia's fault? Because, um, that's like the latest word on the street. Yeah, no, that everything yeah, no, is no, no, yeah, no, yeah, no, it's a lot, it's a lot more fun to blame other people than to actually have to look at yourself. I mean, you know, like Boy, that's, that'd, be a fa that, that'd be fabulous if that strategy actually worked. <laughs> Everybody sees right through it anyway, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, I mean, it, if, if like, speech if like play, if, if, yeah, it's like playing the victim card and it's outside of my control and not my fault actually worked, man. God, that'd be, that really would have made my life a lot easier. <laughs> 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 it, yeah. Guess what? It, ha it hasn't worked since second grade when I could actually articulate a thought called blame somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work. It doesn't work now either. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right, guys. Well, we're going to go ahead and cut this off. If anybody joined late, we'll put it up on the BGW CPA YouTube channel. Thank you so much. We'll look forward to seeing you next week. Lord willing. Sounds Take good. Care, Thank you. See you guys. See you. Bye-bye.